Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, The Federal Tax Lien. What is it? During this program, the presenter will cover the following. How, when, and why the federal tax lien arises, the purpose of the publicly recorded notice of the federal tax lien, the place of filing of the NFTL, including jurisdictions and national registries, the broad scope of the government's lien, the participants' need to know and the NFTL's impact on other matters, the statutory authority, right, title, and interest in real property, right, title, and interest in personal property, including titled and untitled assets, rights to the property, both tangible and intangible, lien properties, statutory statutory super priority, recorded and unrecorded liens, the concept of joint and several liabilities for married taxpayers, and finally, after acquired assets. So the, the presenter for today's program is Robert Shorman. Mr. Shorman was a Revenue Officer Advisor Reviewer, GS-12, in the IRS Advisory Group at Jacksonville, Florida, until his retirement at the end of 2010. He was recognized service-wide for the depth of his knowledge of lien law. He served as the IRS advisor to the Office of the U.S. Attorney for the Northern, Middle, and Southern Districts of Florida on matters specifically related to the federal tax lien, and he routinely provided investigative support to the U.S. Department of Justice Tax Division in Washington, D.C. Mr. Shorman was commended for assisting the Secretary of the Treasury in perfecting federal tax liens related to matters on the national stage. He has investigated high-profile cases, including internationally recognized foreign dignitaries, nationally prominent personalities, and notorious criminal offenders. Mr. Shorman is enrolled to practice before the Internal Revenue Service. We will take two question-and-answer breaks during today's program. If you have a question, please use the chat or Q&A feature found on the right-hand side of the screen to submit your inquiries. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. We do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after today's program is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn the program over to our distinguished presenter, Mr. Robert Shorman. Bob, the program is now all yours. Thank you, Matt. And I'd like to thank the Tasser Group Incorporated in uh, Bluebell, Pennsylvania, for allowing me to do this. And welcome everybody that's online with us today. Um, I'd like to point out before we begin that this is a very introductory presentation. Uh, a comprehensive course of instruction on the federal tax lien uh, would encompass uh, several hours of instruction. And my intent here is to uh, familiarize you with the, with the federal tax lien and uh, why it may impact you in your practice. So the first, the first slide is on the screen, the federal tax lien. What is it? Um, who was the whiz kid that came up with this idea? Well, in a way, you all did. Uh, because the men and women that you elected to send to Congress uh, put the federal tax lien into existence. As we know it today, the federal tax lien uh, was created in 1966. But it actually goes back to prior to the individual income tax to other taxes and exact actually existed prior to the turn of the last century. And so let's uh, let's drive on here. And if I knew how to if I knew how to click to the next slide, I think I would. Oh, sure, Rob, Robert. So if you put your cursor over that blue and green globe, there, there you go. go. There we go. Okay. And the the, the screen is on the uh, the slide is on the screen. Excuse me. And uh, you can you can read. I'm not going to read it to you, but the, uh, the the basic concept is the federal tax lien as it exists now establishes a collateral interest 
in all of your property when you fail to pay your tax. Unlike other liens, when you uh, when you grant a mortgage to a lender and, and take uh, and take money to pay off that house or to purchase that house, rather, uh, the lien applies specifically to that property. Uh, the federal tax lien is much more broad in scope. What you see now are the three conditions that exist for the federal tax lien to arise, and arise is the word that the that the Internal Revenue Service uses. There has to be an assessment, notice and demand, and the taxpayer fails or refuses to pay the tax. So, um, the federal tax lien does not necessarily have to be a published document. It, it actually arises or comes into existence after the tax is assessed, the three conditions that we saw in the previous slide, and it exists as a statutory lien, sometimes known as the secret lien. Uh, sometimes even the taxpayer doesn't know about it at that point in time, depending on whether the taxpayer is paying attention to his mail and, uh, and, and so on. Right? There is another uh, phase of the federal tax lien. Right? It's it's called the Notice of Federal Tax Lien. That's where a document is actually recorded in the appropriate uh, venue to give public notice that a lien does exist, exist on a taxpayer. Okay. The Federal Tax Lien applies to uh, all of a taxpayer's property and rights to property, right? Why do you need to know? Well, because these are the kinds of things in your practice that, that you probably see on a day-to-day -day basis. Divorce cases, uh, estate tax cases, purchase and sale of real estate. All of a sudden you go along and everything is, is working out very nicely. And in the title search, when uh, you're trying to close on a piece of real estate, you discover the federal tax lien. There's a big monkey wrench. Everything comes to a grinding halt. And so a lot of the things that you do as part and parcel of your practice, uh, you know, will, will be affected by the federal tax lien. Uh, you might have, and we'll talk about some, we have some examples of some of these as we go forward in the uh, presentation. Uh, one that we don't have is for sales at public auction. And, uh, that, that's always a nice one because, uh, there are some people that can't resist a bargain, and that property that's being sold on the courthouse steps for pennies on the dollar seems like it's too good to pass up. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll go buy it, bid on it, and buy it, and uh, find out that it's attached uh, after the fact. The authority for the federal tax lien, as I said, comes from the men and women that you sent to Congress, who in 1966 enacted the Federal Tax Lien Act from which were generated the Internal Revenue Code sections, the first three of which, 6321, 2, and 3. There are a handful of others. 6324 pertains to estate taxes. 6325 pertains to uh, lien certificates, withdrawal certificates, release certificates, discharge and subordination of the federal tax lien, and so on. And, of course, the Act also contributed to the creation of the public law Right. There's an extra bullet on this slide that there shouldn't, that the bullet in front of 80 stat 1125 shouldn't be there. That's really a continuation right, of uh, the previous one. Okay, if you have any questions, again, uh, the chat feature is there, and uh, you know we'll try to address them as we go along. Uh, uh, before you, you start the case, or should we drive on? Uh, why don't we take a couple questions? Does someone come into the queue before you start the um, the case study? Um, so we have a question here from uh, Deborah who asked, um, they did their due diligence in a title search and discovered um, that a federal tax lien was recorded against the seller. Um, but the form indicated that there was an expiration date um, on the lien, and the seller had filed a bankruptcy petition, and it was dismissed. 
Um, they were told that the lien continues to attach to the property and must be satisfied in order to close the sale. But they're unable to close the sale, and they have an un a frustrated seller um, and, a, and a pretty mad buyer as well. Um, what, what's going on there in that situation? Uh, now, what was the uh, expiration date of the lien on, on the uh, shown as shown on the? Uh, the expiration date was uh, January fourteenth, two thousand twelve. And the seller had filed a bankruptcy petition in March of 2009, and it was dismissed in March of 2010. March of 09, March of 10. Yes. Okay. So there's there's basically depending on what the dates, the actual dates were of the uh, filing of the bankruptcy petition and the dismissal of that petition. Is somewhere between 12 and 13 months of elapsed time. So uh, the federal tax lien, as recorded with the what did you say, January something of 2012, the expiration. Anyway, date. yep. Yeah, it's going. It's going to be the statute of limitations is going to be extended by the by the length of time that the property was in the custody of the bankruptcy court. In other words, that 12 to 13 months, whatever it is, I, I didn't do the arithmetic on, on, so, but from March of 09 to March 10. So, just, just for a discussion sake, let's just add a year to the expiration date and we'll say that the, the federal tax lien will expire in January of 2013. In order for that property to be sold, the tax lien is going to have to be satisfied at closing. If there are insufficient proceeds to do that, then the taxpayer can apply for a discharge of property from the effect of the federal tax lien, and there's a special way to do that. And we can talk about that in a, in a, in a future presentation. Okay, excellent. Why don't we uh, dive right into the case study? Okay, we can do that. And let's click on to the next slide here. Okay. Uh, there's, there's a basic case study. And in each one of the examples, uh, the, the, the question will be, how do I know if this property is encumbered by a federal tax lien? And we have several different scenarios. What I've done, rather, rather than create uh, a dozen different Taxpayers and their and their situations. I've created one, and then we'll introduce that one taxpayer to a different set of circumstances and consider them separately, uh, as opposed to cumulatively. You'll see what I mean as we go along. And we have we have the case of uh, married married taxpayers, and uh, the next slide will explain more about names, but you'll notice the, the last name of the taxpayer is Van Buren. Any Anytime I use uh, individual names or names of businesses, banks, corporations, lenders, financial institutions, whatever, I use the names of uh, former United States presidents, and so we're not picking on anybody uh, in, in, in particular. But uh, this married couple, they're married, they're uh, joint filers and uh, let's see, let's see what their little issue is and here's here's the slide that explains about names street names are always names of trees in these examples and then we use city county and state names that are real and that's because state law and uh, recording recording locations will vary uh, from state to state and uh, we, we use some real examples to, to make you cognizant of that fact. And then action dates are also important. And actually, as they were in that last example with the uh, federal uh, tax lien, the statute of limitations on that federal federal tax lien was extended by the uh, bankruptcy proceeding. So here's here's the case of our married taxpayers. Um, they were joint. They were joint filers. Right? They got assessed for uh, eighteen thousand six hundred dollars. 
when you stop and think about that. If you look at if you look at the dates on here, you'll see there's about uh, five months of elapsed time between April and September. And we're going to be kind to them and assume that they that they filed. So there's no failure to file penalty, but only the failure to pay penalty. And at five percent per month for a five months, that's a 25 percent add-on. So you can see that their actual tax liability was probably in the vicinity of fourteen thousand dollars. And with penalties and interest at this point, it's uh, well, well, not at this point, but at the time the notice of federal tax lien was recorded, it was already up to eighteen thousand six hundred dollars. Now, and the other thing you might want to notice is when the statute of limitations expires. All right. 2019, 10 years from the date of the uh, filing. Okay, so let's take this example. And we have about eight or nine different scenarios that, uh, that, that Bill and Abby are involved in. We're going to take each one individually, as I said before. They're not cumulative. So, right. here's what we want to do. We want to determine right, whether, the, whether the property that their residence address is actually encumbered by the federal tax lien. Right. We saw this scenario before. They owe $18,600. The federal tax lien was recorded in St. John's County, Florida. Anybody want to take a shot at it with the chat, or uh, shall I just drive on? You can just drive on for the uh, subsequent examples. I'll uh, I'll encourage people to uh, to submit their answers or their thoughts uh, via the chat. Okay. So you know the the object is to determine whether that federal tax lien attaches to the property right, at 10 Maple Street, the, their residence address, and we need to do a little homework in order to get there. So we'll search the records, the official records of the Clerk of Circuit Court of St. John's County, Florida. And we find, first of all, the federal tax claim that was referenced in, in the initial scenario. And uh, it has a serial number 999-9999. And we'll keep that in mind because we have another one coming up later. And, 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 and we'll, we'll use that to differentiate between this one and that one. So let's look at examples A through I. Okay. In, in addition to the federal tax lien that we found, we found a warranty deed for the property. And guess who owns it? Seymour, Seymour Fillmore. By the way, that's a, another president. All right. Millard, Millard Fillmore. Everybody, everybody from Buffalo will know who that is. Now, uh, Billy Fillmore was from, uh, I believe, East, East Aurora, New York. For those of you who are history buffs. Okay. But the question is, does the, does the tax claim attach? And the answer is no. Because the Van Burens are just tenants. They do not own the property. They have no right title or interest in that property. And Seymour Fillmore makes a very nice living out of renting those Florida properties to snowbirds from the north uh, year after year. Okay, let's take another example. Same scenario, same Bill and Abby, Clint and Abby Van Buren. Let's discount the, the, the previous example. That's gone. All right, Seymour, Fillmore. We found, we found the lien again in our search, and now we find the warranty deed granting title to the 10 Maple Street Realty Trust. Now, yeah. does the federal tax lien recorded against Bill and Abby attach? No, it doesn't. All right. We, we don't know who the 10 Maple Real, uh, 10 Maple Street Realty Trust is. All right. Could be anybody. Uh, could be Bill and Abby. More, more, more likely it's Seymour Fillmore. So, but the bottom line is the property belongs to a trust. And that's a separate entity, and, and the tax lien recorded against that married couple does not attach to this property. And 
move on to the next slide here. All right. And there's there's the answer. All right. And title is granted. Right title and interest is granted to the Realty Trust. And again, here's uh, example C. The same basic premise applies. Uh, Jim and Abigail Van Buren have the federal tax lien uh, filed in the amount of 18600 We found that again. But this time we found the warranty deed that granted title to um, William Van Buren LLC as a single-member disregarded entity. Now, this, this isn't a class on trust, and this isn't a class on LLCs, and there could be a lot of ways to, that people own LLCs. There could be LLCs that own LLCs, partnerships that own LLCs, corporations that own LLCs, and so on. But in this case, William Van Buren LLC, as a single-member disregarded entity, is in fact one and the same as the LLC. And so we can conclude that the lien will attach. And there's an answer slide that's going to come up here. There it is. And we see that uh, the LLC and William are virtually one and the same. And let's go on to, and the, the reason I'm doing this is to, is to point out that there are, there are different ways that the, the federal tax lien can attach to these properties, and it takes a lot of research to figure out what's really going on here. Okay, another example, and again, the same basic premise, William and Abigail Van Buren have a federal tax lien recorded against them. We found that. Now we find the deed to the property, and lo and behold, William's name is on it. Not Abigail, but William's brother Julius is on there. They bought that property years ago as tenants in common. It was it was a great investment. And so the federal tax lien recorded against William Van Buren attaches to his separable interest in that property. And if we do a little more research, we're going to find out that when the brothers purchased that property... They had intended originally to do it on a 50-50 basis, but William didn't have enough money to to do that, and so Julius stepped up to the plate, and uh, he put in 60%, William put in 40%, and the federal tax lien attaches to William's 40% separable, separable interest in the property. So if the property is assessed for $100,000, I... Uh, the federal tax lien attaches to $40,000 worth, which, if the property is sold, would be enough to satisfy the federal tax lien. And let's go on to another. And once again, the same basic premise. William and Abigail Van Buren have that federal tax lien. This time we found a quick claim deed. Granting title to William and Abigail. The federal tax lien will attach to this property. However, and we'll go to the answer slide, what we're going to find out is since they acquired the property without clear title, without a valid title search, in other words, all right, uh, there could be prior encumbrances or federal tax liens and state tax liens or anything else from the previous owner that go with that property. And so in, in this particular case, if, if there was a prior federal tax lien, the tax lien recorded against William and Abby would uh, fall behind the existing, in, in order of priority, would fall behind the existing federal tax lien, assuming there, are, there, there is one, okay? and, and there might not be. Uh, another example, this, one, this one's the straightforward example. Okay, you uh, you did the title search at the clerk of circuit court of St. John's County. Again, you found the federal tax lien recorded against William and Abby. And this time you found the deed. And it's a warranty deed recorded against William and Abigail. They own the property. Right title and interest, all theirs. There is no doubt, no ifs, ands, buts, or maybes that the federal tax lien attaches to this property. We're going to take that one step further in the next slide here. And this is 
This is the only example. Well, this one, I think, and uh, where these two go together. This example G ties into example F that we just looked at. Since William and Abigail owned that property, at the time they purchased it in 1999, they also gave a mortgage to the Eisenhower Bank in exchange for the loan to purchase the, the property. Uh, and that mortgage was recorded at the time of the closing uh, in uh, May of 1999. And the significance of that, of course, is that the mortgage is in a priority position over the federal tax loan. So, and as I noted on the slide, uh, this example applies only to F above because they clearly owned the property before. Here's another little variant. We see this in Florida. I don't, I don't know how many other states allow this. This is something called an agreement for deed. Uh, it's sort of like a lease to purchase or rent to purchase. The, uh, the seller and the, the, the willing seller and willing buyers can execute the agreement for deed and, uh, and, and record it. And, and once that's done, and again, this is in the state of Florida. Uh -huh. um, then uh, the, the the willing buyer then has title to the property. Uh -huh. so the seller, in this case, Mr. Fillmore, he has a lien against the property. He's essentially holding the mortgage. So, and as and as long as he gives them the property free and, free and clear, uh, uh, ultimately they will own it. In this particular case. A federal tax lien against William and Abigail will attach to the property. Now, there's a little caveat here. All right. Sup suppose Mr. Fillmore had a federal tax lien which attached to the property okay, uh, prior to the agreement for deed. It would continue to go with the property. So, However, uh, a federal tax lien recorded against Mr. Fillmore after the agreement for deed is recorded would not attach to the property. So, and these are real examples, and if, if you work in the state of Florida, you'll see things like this all the time. Here's another special case. Uh, again, same example. We're going back to William and Abigail Van Buren at 10 Maple Street. We're going to assume that that uh, that they actually own the property. This goes back to example. Yeah, they have they have right title and interest in the property. We did our we did our search. We found again we found the federal tax lien that was recorded in the amount of eighteen thousand six hundred. We found the deed. We know they own the property. And now we find a mechanics lien. Okay, recorded in the name of a roofing company in the amount of $9,000. The mechanics lien, uh, it, it's a unique term. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen it before, but, uh, you know, this this does not uh, apply to automobile mechanics or so on. This, this, this applies to work that was done to the house. Okay, and you'll notice, again, the date, this mechanics lien was recorded on August 8th of 2010. The federal tax lien was recorded back in April, April 26th of 2010. This lien is actually going to have priority over the federal tax lien. Okay, it's called a super priority. And it exists to protect everybody's interest. Right. We can, we can assume if, if we needed to put a roof on the house that it's in the best interest of everybody that has an interest in the property to have that roof repaired. And uh, so the, the, the federal tax lien will, will grant that super priority status in order to allow that repair to take place because it protects the value of the property. It also protects uh, the small businessman uh, and, uh, for, the, for the work that uh, he did in um, restoring the roof on that on that property. There's another little caveat on that, and, and that is um, uh, below a certain amount, 
a mechanics lien doesn't necessarily have to be publicly recorded in order to have priority over the recorded federal tax well, recorded federal tax lien. Forgive me, I'm getting my words mixed here. Uh, in 2010, that that amount was six thousand two hundred and fifty dollars. It escalated to a larger number in 2011, and in 2012, I don't know what the real number is. I haven't looked it up, but my guess is it's around seven thousand dollars. So, uh, so work work done up to seven thousand dollars on the house would have a super priority status over the over the existing federal tax lien. Any anything over that would have to be publicly recorded, and again would have priority over the federal tax lien. So, I think I think we beat the house in uh, St. John's County to death. But let's let's to Van Buren's uh, beyond beyond the horizon, and let's say they uh, even even though they live uh, for the most part at Penn Maple Street in uh, St. Augustine, they enjoy a summer residence in Hanson Beach, New Hampshire. So there's a federal tax lien attached to that property. It was recorded in St. John's County. Well, you have to do a little homework. We went to the Registry of Deeds in Rockingham County. We did not find a notice of federal tax lien recorded for William and Abigail Van Buren. You know, what that means is if that property were to be sold, they own it, it could be sold uh, free and clear. Technically, the lien attaches. But, but since there's no re lien recorded in Rockingham County, nobody's been put on notice that it exists, and uh, the sale would go forward. But then we found the warranty deed. And it does belong to the Van Buren family, but not the same Van Buren's really as William and Abigail. It grants title to the Van Buren Family Trust. And, and the trustees are William. Right? We've seen him before. His brother Julius, we've seen him before. And now we introduce two new players, two sisters, Harriet Van Buren Harrison and Beverly Van Buren Buchanan. And they're all trustees. And so William and Abigail really don't own that property. The federal tax lien does not attach to the property. Ultimately, if that property is sold, uh, they they might have some rights to property in, in the form of the proceeds of the trust, but uh, right now the lien doesn't attach to the property as, as it is recorded. And uh, you'll notice on this slide that for example, if they were beneficiaries of the trust, uh, they would have a uh, right to property or right to a portion of the proceeds of that trust. So let's throw another hook in here. Again, same scenario, William and Abigail Buren. Current fact, claim is recorded in St. John's, St. John's County. And now we move from real property to personal property. Turns out, uh, Bill, Bill owns this nice 2009, uh, 22 foot, uh, fishing vessel. Uh, and it, it has a certificate of number. It's registered with, uh, the Florida DNV. And of course we use a fictitious number here, Florida 1234 and DB for the initials of Van Buren. And it's in the Quincy Adams Marina. We love those presidents, don't we? So the question is, does the federal tax lien attach to the property? And the answer is yes. But, and there's a but, and here it is, okay? Your client, Mr. Van Buren, confides in him, it confides in you, rather, uh, that he owes the marina over $1,000 for rack storage and over 1500 bucks for a service that was done on the boat. This takes us into super priority status again. And we got a duplicate slide here. Okay, so, all right. So the, NF, uh, the notice of federal tax lien, or as it is known as an NFTL, it, it attaches. But the marina has a possessory lien on, on, on the boat. All right. They have a vested interest in it now. 
probably close to three thousand dollars, over a thousand and over fifteen hundred. That's that's twenty five hundred plus, you know, whatever the overage is. It's going to come going to come close to three thousand. The super the possessory lien is going to take priority over the federal tax lien, but under one condition, and that is that that the person holding the property, the person in possession, has to protect his or her interest by securing that property. So it has to be maintained in a locked facility, all right? And and as long as the balance due remains unsatisfied. So if the marina were to take that boat, put it on a trailer, all right, pull the trailer out, put it out on the front lot with all the other boats that are out there so that anybody could hook up to it and take it away, including the owner, uh, that would invalidate the, the possessory lien as far as the federal tax lien, as far as having a priority over the federal tax lien is concerned. It would not, it would not negate the liability due to the marina. Just the priority over the federal tax lien. Now that's, that's, that's one example of personal property. Let's move right along into another example. Uh, the Van Buren's own a much larger vessel. This one's a 41-foot documented sailboat. Registered name or documentation name is Kinderhook. For those of you who are history buffs, you and the Martin Van Buren was from Kinderhook, Kinderhook, New York, and he was known as Old Kinderhook. And hence the expression, okay, by the way. So, the hailing port on the vessel is St. Augustine, Florida, and that's what's on the documentation papers. But the vessel is in Hampton, New Hampshire Harbor. There's no federal tax lien recorded in Rockingham County. We didn't find one when we were there. But the federal tax lien was recorded in St. John's County. And simultaneously, in accordance with both federal law and state law, it was also recorded with the U.S. Coast Guard National Vessel Documentation Center. So now we have two federal tax liens recorded. The original one in St. John's County, serial number 999-9999. And the mirror image of that, serial number 999 9998 recorded on the same day in the National Registry. Also in the National Registry, we found a mortgage on that boat recorded in the name of Truman Maritime on July 1st, 1998. So, the filing of the Liens in both St. John's County and the National Registry are considered to be a single filing under the law. And anything that takes place with regard to the federal tax lien and that vote uh, at any time in the future, especially with regard to the lien, if, 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 uh, if the taxpayer is able to secure a withdrawal of the federal tax lien or uh, something like that, it must also be withdrawn simultaneously from both venues. Uh, the reason this little example is in here is, is to point out that there are national registries for both aircraft and documented vessels. Uh, for those of you who live in landlocked states, that, that might not be as significant as uh, for those of us uh, who can stick our toes in the water anytime we want. Okay, another uh, item of personal property. We'll approach this one in a, in a straightforward manner first, and then I'll just point out a couple of uh, couple of flaws in this little example. Um, but um, it turns out that there's there's an automobile, right? a 2011 Mercedes-Benz sports coupe that we found registered to Abigail Van Buren. And notice it's a 2011 vehicle. Federal tax lien was recorded in 2010, April 26 of 2010. This is an after-acquired asset. The lien attaches. 
the, the purpose of having this example in here. But you might say, well, how did they purchase that vehicle? Uh, if they had enough cash to buy it outright, and that car would have cost more than the indebtedness noticed on the federal tax lien, then they should have full paid the lien first. But we're going to assume that they didn't have the money, and they just financed it. And when they financed it with Mercedes-Benz of North America, the, the federal tax lien was discovered, but instead of getting that nice 2.9% interest rate that they advertise on television, their interest rate is 14.7%. So, does the federal tax lien attach? Abigail wants to step up to the plate and say, nah, it doesn't, because she was just a housewife, and all of the earned income was really Williams. And so the federal tax lien really shouldn't attach to the vehicle which is registered in her name. Except now we have another little problem. It's called the joint and several liabilities of married taxpayers. And what that means is both husband and wife are equally liable for the, for the federal tax when they are married taxpayers filing jointly, as we said in the initial uh, example. And so the claim that she would like to make that she's just a housewife and the federal tax claim doesn't attach um, doesn't carry water. So, uh, we talked about the fact that if they had the money to buy that 2011 Mercedes, they should have paid off the federal tax lien first. There's one other little, all right, this one's a little bit more subtle. If you know the tag number is uh, D over V, and uh, again, 4321 just for the sake of having some numbers. Uh, that's probably a disabled veteran tax. Uh, tag. Uh, the likelihood that Abigail is a disabled veteran is nowhere near as high as the probability that William is a disabled veteran. So if one were investigating this case, one might speculate that uh, William initially had the vehicle and perhaps transferred title to his wife in order to attempt to take it out of the uh, realm of attachment by the federal tax lien. But we're not going to go there. It's just, it's just food for thought. And, uh, again, another another point uh, to, to just indicate that the federal tax lien is a very complicated instrument, and uh, there are lots of uh, implications. Uh, and while I'm mentioning that, by the way, I have, I have a very nice text here. Uh, which I use quite a bit. Uh, this is, this was uh, authored by William T. Plum, Jr. Uh, it's published by the American Law Institute and the American Bar Association and their Joint Committee on Continuing Professional Education. I would commend that to you. Uh, the edition I have is out of date. It gets updated every year. But uh, even even an old edition uh, is, is to have handy. Uh, about Excuse me, Bob. We have a question about this uh, this last example um, with the Mercedes. Uh, David asks: okay. Is is the Mercedes finance purchase money lien prior to the FPL? Purchase money mortgage? You mean? Uh, the question asks, and David, feel free to clarify for us: Is the Mercedes finance purchase money lien prior to the federal tax lien? No, it is not. Okay, the federal tax lien was recorded on uh, April 26, 2010. A 2011 Mercedes couldn't have been purchased in 2010. And so this is an after-acquired asset. And after-acquired assets uh, become subject to the federal tax lien for as long as the lien remains in force. Does that answer the question? I'll, we'll wait to hear from David, but uh, you can continue on with the presentation. Sorry to say. Okay. And, and here's the answer, of course, and it's uh, the concept of joint and several liabilities, which was the purpose of putting that example in. So each house is uh, individually responsible for the tax, and we discussed the uh, 
issue of it being an after-acquired accent, uh, asset. Okay, uh, the next slide, uh, there's a little punctuation error here. There's not supposed to be an, uh, an open paren, in, in, in the, uh, so we'll disregard that. But here's, here's another situation. And again, this is not a class on uh, estate taxes or estate tax yes. or decedent cases, but uh, it, it turns out uh, William, William's mother passed away. She owned a very nice property in uh, Marblehead, Massachusetts, uh, near, near the water. It was appraised at $940,000. And she bequeathed that property in, in equal shares to all four of her children. So William, his brother Julius, and their sisters, uh, Harriet and Beverly, uh, are each uh, equal owners, theoretically, of, of that property. Property is still in the custody of the probate court. Right? The, the, the letters of administration have been, uh, have been filed and the letters testamentary and all that good stuff. Right? So... But what's, what, what's the point of this one, all right? Um, the property's in Massachusetts. William, William lives in uh, Florida most of the year, goes to New Hampshire some other part of the year. We don't know where the other siblings live. But nobody wants to live in Massachusetts. And nobody wants the property in uh, Massachusetts, as they call it. Since I hail from there, I, I can get away with that one. So what's going to happen here is we, you know, uh, the the executor is uh, offering the property for sale. He's not going to record a, a deed in the name of the four heirs. He's going to, he's going to sell the property to a new buyer, con convert the asset to cash, right? and then the proportional share of the proceeds of the sale of the house will be distributed to the heirs. You know, since it was William's mother's, and uh, it's appraised at nine hundred and forty thousand dollars. We, you know, we we can make some assumption that uh, probably the elder Mrs. Van Buren owned the property for a number of years, uh, maybe fully paid off or at least close to that. So uh, there, there should be an adequate amount of money coming from the proceeds of sale, uh, and those are rights to property. That the the, the proceeds of the sale, which don't exist right now, are the rights to property that William and his brothers and si his brother and sisters will have when the property is sold. So, other rights to property uh, that you might consider are the proceeds of an annuity, uh, music or book royalties, uh, and uh, you know people might say, well, you know, I I I I I don't know uh, the boss. So I don't know how many other people write, write music, but there are a lot of people that do that, and and people that uh, write books and, and other things that they might get uh, royalties from, copyrights, uh, patents, uh, and so on. Okay, we're, we're going to try to uh, wrap it up. Again, this presentation has been intended really to be uh, just something to whet your appetite. All right. To let you know that the tax lien does exist out there, uh, it has uh, more force than most people realize. A lot of a lot of people would say, "Well, who cares?" And you know, in in some situations, if you don't need to do anything, who cares might actually be the right answer. You know, if you don't need to sell your house, and you don't, and and and. The government's not going to seize it because it's your principal residence and you live there with your children. Um, you can let that lien go for 10 years till it expires. Um, probably not going to happen in the real world, but uh, it is it is a course of action. So some of the things we talked about are how, how the lien arises. We have to have those three criteria. Uh, just as an aside, when those three criteria are realized, the first one is the assess internally in the Internal Revenue Service. That's called the 23C date. And there's actually um, a living, breathing person that executes the 23C document. 
and uh, uh, creates the tax assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, some of the other things, the notice and demand uh, happen systemically, and uh, the, the taxpayer actions, of course, are at the discretion of the taxpayer. So, but the lien arises when all three of those criteria have been met. And what arises is, again, what is known as the secret lien. It arises 10 days after uh, those three criteria are met, the last one being uh, uh, the taxpayer uh, failing, failing to pay within 10 days after receiving notice in demand. So the lien exists, and it protects the right uh, of, it protects the interest, I should say, of the government uh, in all of the taxpayer's assets. That's it. It's a very broad scope. The federal tax lien is different than any other kind of lien. It attaches to all of the taxpayer's property and rights to property. Now, the government may choose to record that lien publicly. However, the lien is co-ate or perfected uh, even, as it, even as it exists as the secret lien. Federal tax lien, again, as I, I sort of jumped ahead and uh, mentioned that it attaches to all of taxpayers' property and rights to property. Uh, just to the side again, uh, the concept of the federal tax lien did not necessarily originate in 1966 with, with the Federal Tax Lien Act. It actually goes back to 1893, prior to the turn of the last century, uh, on taxes other than income tax, things like uh, liquor tax and, and so on. So the precedent was uh, already set when that was passed in 1966 um, as it relates to income tax. And so what we've seen is uh, the, the federal tax lien attaches to uh, the taxpayer's real property when a taxpayer has right title and interest to any real property, no matter how it is titled in your state and the various ways in which uh, property may be recorded, and it attaches to personal property. Uh, some personal property may be uh, titled assets, like the motor vehicle and uh, the vessels that we described, and they're recorded in various places, uh, DMV in most states. Uh, I threw DNR in there because in Georgia we have that's uh, the Department of Natural Resources, and that's where uh, titles for uh, boats are recorded, uh, boats that are not documented, not federally documented vessels. Federal tax lien also attaches to all of the taxpayers' untitled assets, and there, there could be many, uh, antiques, works of art, jewelry, animals. Animals? Did somebody say animals? Well, I'll tell you what, when... When, when, when you own that uh, AKC registered Pomeranian or that racehorse that's up at Saratoga, right, those, those animals are all of a sudden worth a little bit more money than, uh, than the uh, adopting dog that you picked up uh, as a good Samaritan at the, uh, at, at the local pound. So another one, firearms, that's a good one too, especially collectibles. If, if, you, if you've got that rifle that John Wayne used in uh, Winchester 73, gold-plated and filigree, that's probably worth about a quarter of a million dollars. Other significant things about the federal tax lien are where, where is it recorded? If, if it's recorded in Idaho and, and, you're, and you're doing a title search in Florida, you're not going to find that lien. So, But be aware of the fact that there are things like... Uh, Aircraft and documented vessels uh, that have uh, national registries, and you can find the liens on those types of assets there. What else is important? Priority of liens, of course. Okay, and first in time is first in right, except in the case of those super priorities. All right, and, and those are statutory um, uh, priorities. Or in the case of clouded titles, I mean, the, the quit claim deed where the taxpayer may or may not have uh, acquired title to the property without realizing that there were prior liens that uh, existed. 
Okay, and here are some of the examples, mechanics lanes, possessory lanes. Other super priorities uh, would, in, would include uh, liens by the local county tax assessor, for example. And those liens, uh, super priority liens, depending on the, on the, on the amount, that not necessarily be recorded. So we also talked about the concept of joint and several liabilities. All right. Now, uh, in the case of married taxpayers, we didn't get into other examples. In the case of married taxpayers filing separately, heads of household, and so on. That, that, that's, that's, that's another class. So, all right. And, uh, you get to sign up for that one sometime in the future. But, each spouse is individually liable for the tax, unless for some reason they come up with a good innocent spouse case that might be approved by the Internal Revenue Service. We talked about after-acquired assets. The Mercedes-Benz was an after-acquired asset. It was acquired after the federal tax lien was recorded. Now, uh, in the face of the federal tax lien, and that was, that was nice of your client to purchase that vehicle and uh, essentially share light title in it with the United States government. Now, between you and me, the government's not going to try to seize it because there's not enough equity in it. Um, uh, the, uh, it, it it's upside down, and uh, the IRS doesn't want it. So, and then in the category of rights to property, uh, inherited property, royalties, annuities, and again, this isn't a class in, in uh, estates or estate tax liens. Just to let you know that those things, uh, as you well know, exist out there, and you're going to find that your clients, whether you're doing real estate transactions or bankruptcy transactions or bankruptcy proceedings, rather, um, these things will, will come into play. The federal tax thing will jump out at you, and... Uh, and potentially be a monkey wrench in whatever it is that you want to do. This is pretty amazing, actually. I'm looking at the time. It's uh, 2, 2.57. I don't think we could have timed this much better. Um, that, that concludes our presentation, really, today. I'll entertain any uh, questions that, that you might have. Um, again, it's, this is an introduction to the federal tax lien, uh, to let you know that it's out there. Um, the next thing you might want to know is how to get fit. And uh, we're going to have a presentation on that uh, pretty soon. We, there's, a, there's a little bit of literary license in, in using the term get rid of the federal tax lien, but I borrowed, I borrowed the term from the Internal Revenue Service, so I, from their website, so I can't be all, all wrong. We never really get rid of the federal tax lien, but we might want to discharge federal uh, – uh, discharge real property, rather, from the effect of the federal tax lien. Or we might want to refinance property and subordinate the, the federal tax lien to uh, a refinance, a mortgage uh, uh, being uh, rewritten on a property. Or I mean, we might want to withdraw the federal tax lien. Uh, there might be justification for, for doing that. Uh, maybe the tax lien was improperly filed. Uh, or uh, something like that. And uh, and then uh, one other situation that comes up, and, uh, and that is uh, certificates of non-attachment, non-attachment of the federal tax plan. When there's confusion about the taxpayer to be associated with the federal tax plan, and, and you're, you probably have clients that uh, have this situation, especially in the case of... Uh, Fathers and sons, uh, whose name is, uh, William Van Buren and William Van Buren Jr. And perhaps Jr. lived with his parents for some period of time and has federal tax lien recorded against him at his parents' address. Uh, the parents decide they want to sell the house and move to Florida. And lo and behold, uh, they go down to the, uh, county courthouse and, and they're Clerk of court says, uh, oh, by the way, your property is attached by a federal tax fund. So, uh, that, that's another one we might want to get rid of. So, those are the four major categories of lien certificates, discharge, subordination, 
withdrawal and non-attachment. And uh, those are concepts that we might want to talk about in the future. That concludes my presentation for today. I'd like to thank everybody that was uh, willing to listen to me and uh, the TASA group for allowing me to put this presentation on. And uh, again, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. But I'll well, Robert, we do have a couple questions here in the queue, and uh, I'll just go okay. kind of down the line as they came in. Okay. Uh, John asked... Asked... We're, doing, we're doing this impromptu, so... Yeah, John asked, if a trust purchases real estate and the taxpayer and his wife are trustees, and the taxpayer with the liability is a trustee with his wife, and it is a beneficiary among his wife and children, does the tax lien attach to the property? It may. That's a very complex issue. And it, it's going to turn um, out to be a, a determination based on if the, if, if the trust purchases the property, number one, where did the trust get the money to make the purchase? Okay, if it came from the taxpayer who has the federal tax lien, you know, that's going to be a problem. Um, it's also going to be a problem in a situation where the, the trust has trustees who are also beneficiaries of the trust. Right? And that's going to be governed by state law, and I, I don't know, uh, you know, what it may be uh, in, in your state. There's there's a potential conflict there depending on on the state, and so it's it, it, it's not a question that can be answered straight on a straightforward basis, but uh, it, you know it it could be if if the taxpayer, as I said before, diverted funds to the trust, it, it could be uh, an after acquired purchase. It also could potentially be a fraudulent transfer. I mean, you know, there there are too many variables here, so. That probably doesn't satisfy the, the the question, but it's the best I can do on the spur of the moment. No, it, it's great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from Lisa who asks, do federal tax liens also attach to retirement accounts? Is there any property specifically exempted from the attachment? Uh, that's actually a very good question. All right. uh, federal tax liens, generally speaking, do not attach to retirement and pension funds, okay? There are special provisions under the Internal Revenue Code that allow uh, the federal tax lien or allow assessments against retirement funds, okay? Those require a special application, and they have to be approved by the area director um, for the area in which uh, the taxpayer resides or in, in, in which the, the uh, federal tax lien uh, is recorded. I can tell you based on experience because uh, I, I did that, uh, the likelihood that the area director would approve uh, a lien or any kind of uh, action against a retirement fund is uh, slim and none unless the taxpayer was involved in some egregious or criminal behavior. But uh, just just somebody who, through in, in, inattention, uh, old age, you know, whatever, didn't properly pay attention to it, uh, uh, it it's unlikely that the area director is going to approve that. The area director could, but it's unlikely. Okay, and it sounds like you uh, moved your phone or microphone a little bit because you sound a little distant there. Um, we have another oh, final oh, question. Uh, did everybody did, did, did everybody get the answer to that question? We can. We can. Just kind of repeat it over again. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I apologize for that. That's my fault. Um, the, the the federal tax claim may attached to retirement funds. However, it's, it's unlikely that that would be allowed to happen. In, in, order, in order for the Internal Revenue Service to go after retirement or pension funds, uh, it, it requires approval of the area director for the area in which the tax lien is recorded. Okay. And as I said earlier, and, and probably didn't get transmitted properly, right, 
uh, un unless there's some criminal activity or some particularly egregious uh, situation with the case, it's highly unlikely that the area director is going to approve any kind of assessment, uh, lien, levy, uh, anything like that against a retirement account. And I should add one caveat, which I didn't add before, and that is while, while the taxpayer is still alive, okay, after the taxpayer is deceased, that, that may be a different situation. But uh, an, an ordinary taxpayer who was a wage earner may have contributed to uh, an IRA from, you know, through payroll deductions and um, en ended up with a tax problem through, uh, whatever for whatever reason, inattentiveness, uh, 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 and this, uh, uh, an assessment, uh, a tax assessment that uh, occurred as a result of a lien foreclosure, for example. There was an un un unanticipated addition to the taxpayer's adjusted gross income, and, and he ended up with a liability that he couldn't pay. Um, uh, some situation like that, uh, it, it's, un it's unlikely that the area director is going to approve uh, going after the retirement fund. He could. He has the authority to, but it's unlikely that uh, he or she would do that. Okay, and a final question here from Stephen who asks, is a notice of levy the same as a notice of tax lien? Um, another good question. Actually, uh, no, those are not, they're not one and the same. A notice of federal tax lien is, is recorded to protect the government's interest in a property or in all of the taxpayer's property or rights to property, to, you know, to be to be 100 percent correct. A notice of levy, however, is in fact an assessment, and that will be served uh, on somebody holding uh, property or rights to property that belong to the taxpayer. Uh, you know, who might that be? That might be your bank, for example. So if a notice of levy, if, if you have $3,000 in your bank account, and in the case of William and Abigail Van Buren uh, that, that we used in the example, uh, if a notice of levy was served on their bank in the amount of the $18,600 that was uh, outstanding on that federal tax lien, and, and a notice of levy in the same amount was served on a bank that was holding funds, even if they're only holding, say, $3,000 worth of funds, that notice of levy would attach to all those funds. And 21 days after the notice of levy was served, uh, the party holding the funds would be obligated to turn the money over to the government. Okay, excellent. Uh, with that, we're going to conclude today's program. First, I'd like to thank uh, Robert for putting together an interesting program with great case studies. Uh, thank you for the time and effort that you put into the presentation. I'd also like to thank uh, all those who attended today's program. I hope that you were able to take away uh, some information that you'll be able to use on cases that you're either working on not now or will be working on uh, in the future. If you would like to speak to Robert about a specific matter, you can contact us here at TASA. Our telephone number is 800-523-2319. As I mentioned during the introduction, I will be sending out a link to the archived recording of this webinar tomorrow morning. Uh, the archived recording of this webinar, as well as the archived recordings of all of our past webinars, can be found on the TASA website. If you go to tasanet.com and click on the Knowledge Center tab down at the top of the page, uh, you'll easily find our, uh, our archived recordings. Our next webinar for legal professionals, Passenger Terminal Safety Part 1, will take place on April 18th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, we do take all of everyone's comments uh, under consideration and they help us to produce better programs. Uh, please send me an email. Uh, you'll be getting a follow-up email from me at 3.30 p.m. But please, you can just reply to that email or send me a separate email uh, with your comments or questions um, and we will take them under consideration and they probably will help us to put on better events in the future. So with that, I will end this afternoon's webinar, and we hope to see you at future class events.
Okay, I'd like to thank everybody that uh, participated, if you're still on. And and if you have any comments about my presentation, I'd, I'd be interested to hear them because it, it, it's very difficult to sit here and do essentially a monologue. You know, it's not, uh, we, we don't have classroom type interaction here, so. Right. Okay. Bye, everybody. Probably thank everybody. you, Robert. Okay. And, well, how do we close all of this?